God is good, and Pastor Courtney is a good singer. He's awesome. Yeah, pa Pastor Courtney was supposed to sing last Sunday night, but you may have heard that her brother passed away, and they were not back in time from the funeral, and we extend our sympathy to you, Pastor Courtney, and your whole family, and I know that uh, y'all's faith is strong, and your parents as well, and your si you and your sister, and and um, our, our faith and our hope is in, in the Lord. Uh, Jim Jane's funeral, I, in the early service, I was mistaken. I alluded that it was here, but it's actually a Sixth and Lion uh, at uh, Hamilton's downtown. And um, uh, what a sweet man. He was so sweet. And then Jim Kephart's in Methodist West. Uh, they don't know why, but he's been falling the last week or so quite a bit. And uh, so you could definitely use your prayers. And there are others, too, that uh, got some people going into some surgeries and things like that coming up. So keep all of them in your prayers. Uh, Roxanne Bassett's got some a surgery coming up Friday. Definitely can use your prayers if y'all, some of y'all know about that. So uh, Pastor Jeff and Pastor Zach and Pastor Luke are all out of town. They're ta having their Thanksgiving with their families and it's my my son and I and, and uh, my daughter and, and our grandbabies, and, and we'll take Elizabeth with us too, and, and we'll even let Susan go. Uh, we're all going to Texas. We're going to see my mother. It's the first time we've been there, all of us, uh, in years. And it's the first time that my mother will see Paisley, uh, who's our one-year-old granddaughter. She's just turned one uh, recently. And um, so we'll be leaving Tuesday night when Taylor gets through teaching school there and so uh, uh, we have a lot of things going on this week uh, tomorrow's the biggest day of the operation Christmas child uh, because uh, churches like ours uh, have box after box after box that they're going to be bringing in and uh, and from some relay stations and then we ship for the state of Iowa so anyone that wants to come out for an hour between 9 a.m. and 7 p.m. just come on out and help out I know we can put you to work and then also we'll be, we'll be delivering lots of groceries to the food bank and uh, doing some extra work there. And uh, what we do is with these boxes is we bring them uh, cartons here and we carton them up and then we load the cartons in pickups and take them over and put them in the, in the um, uh, semi-truck. So I want us to pray over these boxes. If you'd reach your hand this way, if, if we could stand with me one more time. And let's just pray over the boxes and those that receive it. Holy Spirit, we pray, God, that you would direct every box that's here and that's been received through the state of Iowa, God, that every box would find the right child. And, Lord, there would be just the right thing in it. And, Lord, it would touch their heart. And I know that the Graham organization, the Samaritan's Purse, they bring Jesus with every box, every location. This is about souls loving enough to give and care for a child and bless them and then to give them the greatest gift of Jesus. And I pray you begin to open the hearts of every little one that receives one of these boxes. You already know in advance every child, God, is going to receive a box. I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit supernaturally that you would just take those kids and let them open their hearts to you, Jesus, work in them by your Spirit. Break down darkness and bondages and oppressions and possessions and anything else that might prevent them from knowing you, Jesus. I pray, God, may it be to your glory and the souls be saved, and we thank you for it. And everybody said, amen, amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm talking tonight uh, in Ecclesiastes, uh, and uh, there's a couple of chapters there, that five and six, that uh, I have uh, secrets for for, for, for living and managing your life and uh, living and dying happy. It's an old comedy routine. The, the robber walks up to the comedian and he jams a gun in his ribs and he pokes him and, and he says, your money or your life? And then there's a really long pause and the comedian does nothing and doesn't reply. The robber nudges him with that gun again and impatiently says, well... Finally, the comedian says, don't rush me, I'm thinking about it. And so, now, obviously, you guys would, would right away say, of course, take my money, you know. 
but it's, it's a, bit, a little bit funny with the point because the truth is that many times we treat our money like it's more important than life. It's true. We can choose money over life by pursuing careers and accepting jobs offered purely based on the one that pays the most money. Some people relocate their family simply for a job that pays more even though it's not better for their family. We worry more about property values in our uh, neighborhood more than we do moral values in our, in our uh, communities and they're being taught in our school districts. And too many people have chosen money over wholesome and abundant life and the things that money can buy and the pleasures. Social and political structures are often shaped more by money than what's best for society. In some societies, officials take blatant bribes. I mean, it's terrible. But in other societies, including America most likely, in my opinion, they simply take campaign contributions and offer friendly legislation or government contracts in return. And uh, too many business leaders, politicians, have started their careers with high ideas for public service, but then let money determine their decision. And often, it's not what's best for the people, it's what's best for them. It's possible to get an abundant, an abundant life instead of merely getting money. It is. It's possible to do that. It's possible to live and to die happy. And I want to give you some things that will cause you to be able to, to live happy and die happy. And I want you to know up front that money can't buy one of them. Everything that makes you live happy and die happy can never be purchased with money. But they're all things that are wonderful. And uh, at the heart of the discussion of Solomon, Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 19, it says, and, and that's the, the first verse that we have here, when uh, Ecclesiastes 5. 519. There it is. It says, when God gives any man wealth and possessions, enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, uh, in their toil, this is a gift from God. And so, is money wrong? No. Does it bring happiness? No. But if you can live your life with contentment and joy, and for things that matter more than the world goods, then you can achieve abundance and happiness both in this life and when you lay your life down at death. Many people are fearful of death so much they won't ever face it. I mean, people, when you bring up that we only have a few more years, they get upset with you. When you're about 70 years old, all of a sudden you realize 20 years and I'm 90. And I'm not saying you should die when you're 90 not saying that. I'm glad that people are living in, well into the upper, upper 90s. It's fine. But not everybody's going to. And the, fa the thing is, is that we have to face that someday we live and then we die. There's a point of the time to die. And there's some things that will make us happy, but money can't buy them. And the first one, if you want to be happy, and Pastor Hawkins did a great job at our, at our uh, and so I've got a very short point here at our banquet uh, Thursday night with the seasoned saints is contentment. Ecclesiastes chapter 510 says, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. It's like trying to scratch poison ivy. You know, it itches and you just itch and you itch. The more you scratch, the more you need to scratch. And there's never enough scratch, scratching to satisfy your itch. That's exactly what money is. Never enough to satisfy we need to learn to be content. And then the second thing is friendship. You see, money suddenly attracts lots of people who pretend to be your friends. But how many are truly interested and care about you? But you know, to be happy, friends make you rich. But you can't buy them. In fact, money could even make it difficult to know who really is your friend. I'm thankful that I've got, I don't even, I can't even count them all. Maybe 50 to 70 people that I count among best friends. And that's a treasure that I, I, I can't even measure. And um, I'll tell you, uh, when, when someone once said, if you want someone to be there for you when you need them, then be there for them when they need you. Build a bridge and go across and minister, and when you need someone, that bridge will be there and they can walk back across it to you. Sometimes it's true that the more money you make, the more 
parasites you attract with wealthy people can't even tell who, they're, who really is real about wanting to be their friend. Ecclesiastes 5.11 says this, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? So do those who consume them as goods increase. So all of a sudden, you've got people all around you. Once you get rich, it's hard to know. Are they interested in you or your money? And wealth attracts greed, greedy parasites, the way meat attracts maggots. It's true. I, I know a few people that, that have been wealthy, and it's hard to know how to make a friend. I've noticed that some of them, they'll make friends with other people who are also wealthy, knowing that they don't need anything from them, don't want anything from them. I'm assuming that's why. I'm not sure. But I can tell you that a lot of money sometimes ruins friendships. And also, you can't tell who really is a friend. The third thing, the third thing, not only contentment makes you live happy and die happy, and not only does friendship make you friends, help you live happy and die happy, but peace Peace of mind. Peace of mind helps you live happy and die happy. And all of these things cannot be purchased with money. Money lovers have a hard time with worry. You got money. We may think an ordinary working person with bills to pay and almost no money to spare would mo worry much more than a person financially set for life. But not so. Ecclesiastes 5.12, the next verse, says this. The sleep of a laborer is sweet whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of a rich man permits him, permits him no sleep. Why? Why does that make sense? Well, an ordinary guy who puts in a hard day's work, he eats a sandwich, he lives in a humble home, he can relax and sleep at night. Meanwhile, the tycoon tosses and turns. The head of one of the most successful corporations uh, a few years ago wrote a book, and he did not entitle it how Success Freed Me From Worry. He actually titled it, Only the Paranoid Survive. And that's why people with a lot of money, they don't want to lose it. They're worried about the stock market. They're worried about the, the, the money turning bad or the value of the dollar going down or just what's going to happen or, or their competitor, they're worried. And, 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 and so he, he actually wrote the book, Only the Paranoid Survive. He doesn't say how relaxed and satisfied he is with his fortune. Instead, he worries constantly that some competitor will catch up with his company or get ahead. So money cannot buy peace of mind. But if you want to live happy and you want to die happy, you need peace of mind. The fourth thing you need to live happy and die happy is security. Security, but money can't buy that either. Ecclesiastes 5, 13 and 14 says, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun, wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when he has a son and there's, not, there's nothing left for him. You see, if you hoard like a miser, you're always focusing on your finances, you miss out on the many things in life that are unrelated to money. There's so many things that are much better. They're not related to money. And sometimes we're so busy with the things that are related to money, we miss out on the most beautiful, simple things. Simple. Fishing pole, little worm, a little bass. Or if you're a big-time fisher like some of you maybe, or you tell fish stories, it's a big bass. Why be a miser? You know, if you add a why to the word miser, it spells misery, and that's what you get if you're a miser. Money makes a miser miserable, and the possibility of losing his money makes him even more miserable. Thieves can strike quickly, and markets can change so rapidly. Currency can lose value so suddenly that no wealth is safe. Proverbs 23, verse 4 and 5, it says this, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Isn't that the truth? So if you want peace of mind, you're not going to get it having a lot of money. It's just not going to, it's not going to happen. I remember when I was um, first married within the first year, my father, he looked at me and he said, son, are you happy? 
We lived in a one-bedroom apartment. The whole apartment was about 500 square feet. I could touch the, the stove and the kitchen table that we ate at one stroke. It was a furnished apartment. We paid $115 a month. That included all utilities and everything else that went with it. We lived on $215 a month. We had less than $5 every month at the end of the month. And he asked me, are you happy, son? I said, never been happier in my life, Dad. He said, well, let me tell you something. Money's never going to buy you happiness. He said, I know you're kind of poor right now. I know y'all don't have a lot. And my dad, every once in a while, about once or twice a month, meet me in the hall, the walkway, and I can remember almost every time it was always, we had a sanctuary of two sets of pews like this. And, um, and it was always from the pulpit looking out, be the left wall along that set of pews. He would catch me about halfway and he'd slip me a $20 bill. Now, can you imagine we're making 215 a month and he gives me a $20 bill, what that did? That helped us not starve. We ate, we ate a lot of things that uh, we dreamed up that were very inexpensive. My mother-in-law had Texas Jack and it had some stuff in it that, 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 that wasn't always the after effect of most beautiful. And, but it was cheap. We figured it out one time. It was six cents a serving and as a meal, six cents. And it was healthy, uh, but it, you know, it was cheap. And um, uh, my dad said to me, well, son, let me tell you something. He said, you can, it's not how much money you make. He said, it, every time as you get older and you do this and maybe you make a little more money, a little more money, a little more money. If you just keep living up the standard of all that you make, you think you're going to get big, so this little bigger place, a little better car, a little more of this, a little better clothes, a little more of that, a little more of that, and use your money and use your money, you're not going to be any happier. In fact, you're going to find yourself less happy? Probably. He said, let me give you some advice. He said, when you get a raise, take half of that, at least half of it and save it so that you have money when someone has a need. And then he told me a story. He said, when I was a baby, there were three of us. I have two older brothers. And he said, they got to a place where they didn't have any food in the cupboard whatsoever, and they prayed. And he had in his mind, because my dad couldn't read because he dropped out because of depression and his mother died early. My mom had to teach him to read. And it was early on, and they really struggled. And um, he um, said that, that he just felt led to go to a neighbor. He didn't know him very well. And he said, can I borrow some money from groceries? We got three little kids. We don't have anything in the house to eat. And that man gave my dad $15. And he said, my dad was shocked because at that time, that was a lot of money. That was about 1954, 53, 54. And he went and bought groceries with it. My dad made sure he paid him back, but that man said, you don't need to pay me back. But that impacted my dad forever. And he always wanted to have money to be able to help anybody that ever needed help and to be able to bless anyone that needed to be blessed and be able to give. That's the way he was. And at Thanksgiving time, which we're about to have, we had strangers in our house that my dad met that were lonely or broke shared our family time together. It impacts a person. What I'm saying to you is while my dad valued saving to have money in case there's something that comes up and I think it's an important thing, the way he valued it was that you don't need all this stuff. It's better to have something to give somebody. And uh, I think controlling the standard of living that you live by, not basing it upon that you're able to make more and more and more money and continuing to raise that standard and raise that standard and raise that standard and just being content will give you peace of mind. But when we want more and more and more, it doesn't help us. And when we get time to die, here's the fifth thing that we want to be happy is an assurance that we have life. The fifth thing is life. Life. 
life after death. Even if your money doesn't fly away and you leave behind, you will definitely, you will definitely leave your money behind. Even if your money doesn't fly away and you leave it behind, you will definitely leave your money behind. There's a story about a, an angel who visited a businessman and he promised to grant him one request. And then the man thought for a moment and he smiled and he said, ah, I got it. He said, I'd like to, to have the, uh, the financial section of the newspaper one year from now. And uh, so I can see the future and I can, and his request was granted and he eagerly scanned the future stock prices and marking the biggest winners and gloating over how much money he would make and by investing in these stocks, looking at this, this in advance, one year in advance stock market page. He's going to get rich, but suddenly on this side, something caught his eye. There was a picture of himself there. Beneath the picture was his obituary. The man would be dead, unable to enjoy his wealth. Sounds like a Jesus story, doesn't it? In the Bible, the Bible mentions that. So as a fool, you build barns, more barns, and fill them up. Remember? And he says, but you don't realize you're about to die. See, of all problems money lovers face, the biggest problem is death. All the money in the world can't prevent death from coming. When it comes, you can't keep a penny of what you've piled up. And this is final verse in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 15 to 17. It says this, Naked a man comes from his mother womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can, and notice this phrase, carry, can carry in his hands. This too is a grievous evil. What does a person gain since he toils for the wind? All his days he eats in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. All their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. See, Solomon wrote Ecclesiastes, and he doesn't say that when you die you take nothing with you. He says you can take nothing you can carry in your hand. So what do we take with us? It has to do with being happy while you live and when you die. What do you take? You take your character. You take your fruit. Um, there's a lot of things we can take with us. Our relationship with God. The memories of a life well lived. Because the Bible even mentions that in hell, one of the things that's torturous is your memory, like a worm eating away. You know what it's like to have a broken conscience and guilt and a mind that's broken because of thinking back, remembering, dreading, regretting, wishing things were different. So we can take ourselves, we can take our character, we can take our relationship with God. These are the things that make life rich and valuable to us today. If it sometimes looks as, 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 uh, as uh, uh, you think that success depends more on finances, it's the way we think about things that success has more uh, about finance than fairness and our focus more on money than morals, then we need to refocus. If money is all you have, you've nothing except an itch for more money and some parasite wanting a handout, a, sleep, a sleepless paranoia, misery, utter bankruptcy in the face of death. If you love money, you can't live well. And if you certainly, you certainly can't die well because the most important things in this life and the life to come are things money can't buy and death can't take away. And I've said it over and over again. But we do want to be blessed and live a blessed life and a happy life. And every one of these things that I've mentioned that money can't buy, God offers. Ecclesiastes 5, verse 18 to 20 in conclusion says, Then I realized that it is good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him. For this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. This is a gift of God. One version says, enables, moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, 
and accept his lot and be happy in his work. This is the gift of God. He, and he seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with the gladness of heart. See, there is life, happiness, and death, happiness. You toil. You may not have much. But you have God. And God's blessed you and you could enjoy it. And you can enjoy your life as you go through it. The person with God in his heart's delighted to be alive. He knows life is not always fair. And the poor sometimes get a raw deal from people with power and money. It always has been that way. It always will be that way. Get used to it. If you remember, the Bible is full of complaining about why does, the, why does the wicked man seem to prosper? Remember? But in the end, it's not the case. But a person of faith enjoys his meals, he works with gusto, and any money or possessions he has are blessings, they're not burdens. God keeps him occupied with the gladness of heart. The believer with a heart after God is too busy enjoying God and his gifts, too busy carrying out the God-given task and the work of God, too busy making the most of life to get bogged down in greed and in the gloom that it brings. Proverbs 11.4 says this, it says, Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. See that? Look at that. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Rich or righteous? What would you rather be? In 1 Peter 1, verse 18 and 19, and if you're here tonight, and you're not sure about when you die that you would go to heaven, there's something that has been given much greater to you than riches, gold or silver, and that's Jesus' his life and his blood. It says, it, says it, is, uh, it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's the riches for all of us. Solomon says a life without God is meaningless and empty and money cannot buy your way out of that emptiness. We go back to the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and we conclude in verse number 19. says this, Do not store up your, for, yourselves, for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One difficulty is riches is that if we look at them, I, that will be our heart. Our heart will be after them. Our heart needs to be after God. The words of Jesus. And Paul says in Timothy, and I think it sums it up just beautifully, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 17 to 19, he says this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasures for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of life that is truly life. You want to live happy? You want to die happy? Find contentment in Jesus. Find friends. Jesus as your friend and the friends of the family of God that carry character and, and, and enjoy friendship. It's the most precious thing we can have on earth. Get the peace of mind that comes through how to be in a right relationship with God. Find security. The security not of money in case something happens, but the security that even if somebody kills you, you'll go to heaven. You may get sick and die, but you'll go to heaven. You may lose all your money, but the Bible says he's never seen the righteous forsaken or begging bread. Find security that only comes in Jesus. And if you want real life, it's abundant life on earth and eternal life in heaven. You can live and you can die happy. We don't need to be miserable. We can have peace. Will you bow your head with me and close your eyes? I felt so specifically given this message tonight. And I believe there's those that 
that aren't ready for heaven in this place. And that you're not sure if you would die that you would actually go to heaven. But God has given his son Jesus the greatest gift ever. And he'll forgive your sins and come in a real way into your heart to live there. And maybe you don't have any money, but you're trying to find some meaning by improving yourself and getting that money. Even poor people have money that they love as a, as a problem because they think it'll be their answer. Well, really, Jesus is the only answer. So as we bow our heads and close our eyes to respect our neighbors, I'd really appreciate that. Is there someone that says, I'm going to ask Jesus into my heart. I know it won't be long. I might die, or maybe it's 50 years you're going to die. But you want to prepare now and find contentment, security, life, friends in Jesus. You want, you want peace that comes only through Jesus. And you know that Jesus can give it to you and he'll come into your heart. You don't have to live guilty or condemned or shameful. He'll forgive every sin and give you a new life and make you brand new. It's not a belief system that you embrace the, in your mind. It's a happening of Jesus because God is present right now that will come into your heart by his spirit. And once again, thank you for re respecting, bowing your head downward and closing your eyes so that even if your eyes were peeking, you couldn't see anything but the floor. And you're here and you would like to slip your hand up quickly and say, pray with me. I'd need Jesus this way. I want to make sure that I'm ready for heaven. Anybody here? Yes, I see you. Anyone else? I want Jesus in my heart more than anything else. You live poor, you die rich when you have Jesus. Anyone else? If you were to die, are you sure you'd wake up in heaven? The Bible says today is the day of salvation. The enemy says, don't do it now. Nobody's looking. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to expose you. Do anything. You just say, I really need Jesus in a different way than I've ever known him. I need that peace. I need Jesus in a great way. And you hear, would you slip your hand up and say, pray for me, I really, yes. Jesus, thank you, yes, thank you, Jesus. I need Jesus in a different way. I need Jesus in a different way. We're caught up in the American rat race, and Jesus is on the back burner. Thank you, Jesus. I pray, God, come by your spirit and by your grace. I can't change a person. I can't change their heart. But by your spirit, you can. You can give peace. You can give love. You can extend your mercy and forgiveness in a great way. We turn from ourselves. We say, Jesus, we don't need all this world has to offer. We can live abundant, free, and happy, and joyful with you, God, with a peace that passes all understanding, unexplainable joy. Fill us with that, God. We're so full of fixing the flesh and feeding the flesh and providing for the flesh that we miss the Spirit. I pray, Jesus, help us all to have more of you.